Today we're in Biel in Switzerland at the Omega Museum delving into a captivating topic. Omega's illustrious journey in timekeeping for the Olympic Games. Few names command as much as respect in the realm of timekeeping as Amiga. The story of Amiga actually begins in 1848, when Louis Brun establishes a workshop in La Chaux-de-Fonds, Switzerland. He made pocket watches with precision movement, and Brand's skills soon garnered acclaim across Europe. However, it wasn't until the early 20th century when Amiga's legacy truly unfolds. In 1894, the renowned Amiga Calibre made its debut, laying the groundwork for the brand's future in precision timekeeping. Amiga's prowess was particularly acknowledged in observatory trials where there was an intense competition among watchmakers to showcase their precision achievements, reaping considerable benefits in publicity and fame. Amiga's commitment to precision found a fitting stage in the world of sports as early as 1905 when the brand started to serve as a timekeeping for sports events in Switzerland and abroad. In 1932, Omega was appointed the official timekeeper for the Olympic Games, marking the beginning of a long-standing partnership with the world's most prestigious sporting event. Since then, Omega has played an integral role in capturing the triumphs and achievements of athletes on the global stage, utilizing state-of-the-art timing technology to ensure fairness and accuracy in competition. In that year, one Omega watchmaker traveled all the way from Beale to Los Angeles armed with 30 stopwatches in a suitcase for the judges to operate. Each piece had been officially certified as a chronometer by an observatory and was accurate to one tenth of a second. Most impressive was the split second function that allowed in intermediate times to be recorded. The first Olympic Winter Games were organized in 1936, which set new challenges. For instance, timing ski events. They used synchronized stopwatches, one at the top of the slope, one at the bottom. The judge would write the exact start time on a slip of paper to be sent downhill to determine the results achieved. From these beginnings, Omega has continued to be official timekeeper for almost all the Olympic Games, with the introduction of countless technological breakthroughs and improved sports timekeeping from one tenth of a second to one thousandth of a second or even one millionth of a second today. Among these, the electronic era started in 48, opening up the way for a revolution in accuracy of timekeeping. In St. Moritz, the traditional finish line tape was replaced with a highly reactive beam of light. That was the magic eye. As soon as the first athlete crossed the finish line, their race time was electronically stopped and could be measured to the nearest of one thousandth of a second. In London that same year, the first photo finishes were taken to check and determine with precision who had finished first. From 1964 time was simultaneously visible on the television, changing the viewing experience forever. In 1968, the arrival of Omega's touchpads was a defining moment in the timing of swimming. Since then, when a swimmer reaches the finish, he was able to stop the time with his own hands, with no more dispute about swimming results. In 1984, the first false star detection devices were introduced, measuring the pressure exerted on starting blocks. As you can imagine, with the acceleration of the pace of technological progress, things are dramatically evolved over the past decade. To better understand the latest development in this field, we'll take you to a small village in the Swiss Jura Mountains, Corgemont. It is there that the most advanced technology in terms of sports timekeeping is being developed and deployed to time sporting events all over the world. There we'll take a look at the latest technologies, high-speed cameras and more advanced data te analysis techniques, including sensors, GPS tracking and computer algorithm. Let's go. Aylan, thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, explain us how the timing uh, done by Omega during the Olympics in Paris is going to be done. Uh, it's already a long history uh, from Omega to do the Olympic timing since 1932, which is of course extremely important that everything is as precise as possible. How are you going to do the timing this year in Paris? For Paris, Omega is going to deploy 350 tons of equipment 
operated by about 550 timekeepers mm -hmm. to measure the performances and the results of all athletes participating in all competitions. So we came a long way uh, since 1932, where actually only one watchmaker was sent all the way from Switzerland to Los Angeles with, in his suitcase, 30 stopwatches. At the time, uh, Omega was chosen because it was the only company who could provide 30 certified chronographs accurate to the tenth of a second. And mm -hmm. it was the first time at the Olympics that the times of athletes were measured with certified stopwatches. Nowadays, you don't do, use stopwatches anymore. But how is it done these days? For instance, with, uh, with running, with swimming, with, but I think you do much more than just running or swimming. So Every sport is different. Every sport has different rules mm -hmm. and requires different pieces of equipment mm -hmm. to make sure that we capture every moment and every result of any athlete. So typically in sports where timing is necessary, where there is a finish line, mm -hmm. you have a start device, you have devices that will capture the performances of the athletes between start and finish. And typically in athletics, you would have photo finish cameras taking 30,000 pictures per second of the finish line in order to capture uh, the result of the athletes and all these devices capture what the humans cannot see with their bare naked eye. And this is what makes uh, the difference with our technology. So back in the day, that one watchmaker, 30 stopwatches, and nowadays fully digital. Uh, when did that switch from mechanical to digital happen? So there was a big shift from manual timing to electronic timing between the 40s and the 60s. Actually, mm -hmm. there was a big controversy at the Olympics in 1960, where two athletes were having the same average time in swimming in the 100 meter final freestyle. So at the time, as there was manual timekeeping done, three judges were measuring the time mm -hmm. of every single athlete and the average time was then taken as their final time. Yeah. Two athletes finished with the same average time and the head judge awarded the Olympic gold medal to one of these two athletes and the Olympic record to the other one. So obviously a big, big controversy. Eight years later, Omega introduced the famous swimming touchpads, which made swimming the only sport where athletes would stop their times themselves. And that was uh, the very beginning of that change from manual stopwatches to electronics. And obviously uh, it helped uh, the fairness of competition, eliminated human reaction times. Mm -hmm. And that was a big, big uh, uh, evolution in the history of timekeeping. So you, you just mentioned uh, that controversy about uh, the, the swimming times. Uh, how did that go? How did Omega find a solution? Well, there was indeed that big controversy in 1960, uh, the Olympics in Rome. Were, mm -hmm. So Omega came up with a fantastic technology, which were the, the swimming touchpads. And they made swimming the first sport where athletes could stop their time themselves. And they do that by pushing the pad between one and a half and two and a half kilos, um, and as such, stop that, stop their race. Now, it's very important for them to push the pad because we would like to avoid that the waves produced by the athletes mm -hmm. while swimming are stopping the time instead of themselves, which is okay. why, according to the rules, there is this push, slight push needed between mm -hmm. one and a half and two and a half kilos. And the start, how does that go from the starting block? Uh, is there also a sensor inside? There is also a sensor in the starting block, which is in the back of it, similar to athletics. However, we measure differently the reaction times. In athletics, we would measure the increased pressure into the blocks. And in swimming, we would measure the release pressure. So it's slightly different, different rules in different sports. So requires also different sets of equipment and different ways on how to measure uh, at least performances. So in that respect, you know, going from uh, the, the proper timing of a, of a match, but you just told me you do much more than just the timing. Can you elaborate more on that? In 2018, at the Olympic Games in Pyeongchang, Omega introduced for the very first time motion sensors and positioning systems. Mm -hmm. Thanks to these technologies, 
uh, we uh, developed a very accurate and detailed understanding of the athlete's performances between start and finish and as a consequence could explain how an athlete got to their final result where they gained lost time or points eventually. All these data are also interesting for the athletes themselves. Athletes are our primary clients so of course all technologies that we develop are mainly for them. So in the case of these motion sensors and positioning systems, they all receive, if they want, a, um, an analysis of their performance after their race for analytics purposes as well. And for coaches, obviously that data is extremely interesting because yeah. eventually it may change some training habits. So besides the athletes, uh, I can imagine that's super important for them to know and to learn much more about their own performance. But behind us, we see some screens with uh, lots of data, which is, I think, good for, for people watching at home and maybe also in stadiums. Do you also provide those services? Uh, you're right. We're uh, providing also services to broadcasters. Mm -hmm. So all graphics that you would see around a sports competition would be provided by us. Mm -hmm. So you can think of uh, the full chain of delivery, we're capturing a result or athlete's performance data. Mm -hmm. We uh, treat it through specific sports uh, results and data handling software. And we display the result or the data also on screen on TV. So that full chain is managed completely by us. We even produce our own cables, making sure that we have the full control of the entire chain. Uh, and that is extremely important to maintain the quality standards that we want to have. So suppose something goes wrong in terms of electronics or something. Do you also have backup systems? Well, if you're looking at uh, all these athletes training their entire life for their particular moment at well, the Olympics. One moment, yeah. And for some of them, it may be around 10 seconds only. Uh, in a hundred meter. Mm -hmm. So uh, they deserve the best technology and the best services uh, to measure their performance. So we cannot do any mistakes mm -hmm. and we need to prepare to be prepared for any kind of eventualities. As such, we have a minimum of two uh, systems running in parallel that are entirely synchronized where we can switch from the main system to the backup system mm -hmm. at any mo moment in time during the competition without losing any data. Depending on the sports and the rules of the sports we can go even up to four backup systems um, but not only the systems themselves are backed up as you mentioned it also power is backed mm -hmm. up we can run on batteries to finish a race in case we get power cuts. Uh, we have also uh, double teams in, in special cases to make sure that we can, uh, you know, run and finish a competition no matter what happens. It's Paris 2024, but you already have ideas of what's coming for the next Olympics? Uh, we try everything uh, to eliminate any single point of failure. Yeah. So I cannot reveal too many details. We have our innovation plans laid out for mm -hmm. the next six to eight years. So we know exactly in which direction we want to go. What I can say is that we're certainly going to work with the element of time. Okay. Uh, to understand and improve how we measure time. Mm -hmm. It's easy to measure time, but it's very difficult to measure it accurately. So that's an area where we're certainly going to, to evolve. Uh, we now in Paris have um, another area where we start uh, deploying and exploring even more with artificial intelligence. We have the first solutions with AI uh, that have been uh, deployed in 2018 evolved now also for Paris where we can have athletes comparisons. So in addition to measuring time, we will certainly also work on the on our understanding of what's happening through time. So these are the two areas where, where we're certainly going to evolve uh, in the future. That's pretty impressive going from, you know, from mechanical stopwatch that's very precise to working with uh, cameras, sensors, uh, lots of computers, double, triple, quadruple backup systems uh, and, uh, and even AI involved. Maybe a step to the side, what is your perspective on, on timing? Well, if you, if you take a step back and look at what is needed for a sports competition, you need actually three things. You need athletes who would perform, mm -hmm. you need a place where they can perform, and you need a timekeeper to measure their results. This shows how important the role of Omega as official timekeeper is at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Without Omega, I think it is fair to say that there would not be an Olympics. So that role comes with a lot of responsibility. 
It makes us a true working partner of the organizing committee, the IOC and the athletes and we have no room for failure. So this role is humbling us a lot. We're very proud to have that and we're very much looking forward to finally uh, start our operations in Paris in a couple of weeks from now. Thank you so much and good luck and it's really impressive. Good luck with the entire operation in Paris. Thank you very much for coming over and for your interest.